OK, James, Listen, thank you very much for giving up some time and to um, offer an interview for um, um, the, this uh, collection of films that David and I are doing about recovery. Um, and I was just thinking right at the beginning of this um, that actually I was trying to work out exactly how long I'd, I'd, I'd known you. And, and I guess the substantive part of that is almost approximately a decade now, because we're talking a period that led up to North Wales Recovery Community, didn't it? So, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think probably more like 15 altogether, Wolf, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, and so I, I'm going to come into some of all of that, really. Um, and as you know, this conversation is about recovery, but it, we're really interested to start with, obviously, um, um, you know where it's there to be had just a little bit about people's personal story of recovery and that might bring us up to the moment when you and I really started to meet or work together and we can talk about your project the brilliant North Wales recovery project next um, but tell me something about your journey so I know that this is a Manchester based journey because I know you're a Man City fan and all the rest yeah. of it um, yeah. even though we both now live in North Wales so it, I guess the chaos comes from Manchester and the recovery starts in North Wales something like that but you yeah, yeah, story. yeah that, that's exactly it. Yeah, you just probably said about 15 minutes there. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, it's just any old typical sort of inner city lad, um, uh, single parent family, um, big issues with um, addiction, particularly alcoholism uh, and mental health uh, and domestic violence throughout the family. Um, and uh, just, I think basically, I just, Ever since I can remember, I was I've been scared, I've been fe fearful every day um, that I can ever remember. It just it was just always a tinderbox sort of growing up. There was a lot of um, just a lot of people who liked to drink, who also liked to fight afterwards, who, li who lived together, and a lot of deep running family resentments and a lot of anger and animosity, and just I think, like I say, just constantly being on edge. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, and, you know, normal sort of council estate upbringing, secondary school, etc. got into uh, substances early on, your stereotypical pot, uh, party drugs kind of sort of route. Um, but I've always had like a bit of a, like a bit of a business acumen, I think you could say, or just like this, this ability to kind of rustle up a fiver out of like two bottle caps or something. Um so very early on, I kind of recognised that uh, you know, if I was like selling drugs, I would like fund my own kind of usage, and and it just started off with with pot really, and, and pot was always like my my sort of first love um, in, in terms of sort of substance use. Never been a massive drinker. I mean, I have to say at this point now that at the end of the story, I'm not abstinent now. I drink on a on an occasional social basis, but I just think growing up in that environment, I just. It, just don't like alcohol. I don't like to be, ironically, even though I spent so much time at the football, but I don't like to be around drunk people in a, in a potentially volatile situation. Um, and then I kind of progressed through school and, and, like I say, very, very low level kind of sort of dealing. Um, and then just became involved more and more um, in offending and, uh, and, and supplying in drugs, really. And I think, again, like I say, I'm not, I don't blame anybody for, for, you know, for, for how things turned out, uh, you know, I've, the choices have always been mine. There's been choice points all along. But I think when you grow up in a certain environment, um, your, your social class, your access to education, standard of education, access to housing, um, all that sort of stuff, it, 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 it narrows your options and very much limits your sort of choices. Um, so kind of for me, I think where I, like I grew up, it was, there wasn't many well-paid jobs. There was no well-paid jobs, um, you know. So, kind of, you'd look at people who were going out and working for two or three hundred pound a week, you know, working a bollocks off fifty hours a week for for four or five pound an hour, and you'd look at lads sat on the other side of the fence who, who were selling drugs and driving around in nice cars and nice clothes and jewelry and big mobile phones when he first come out. Do you remember they were like the big bricks? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Only people who ever had a mobile phone in those days were estate agents or drug dealers. So, so it was almost like it sounds terrible, but it sounded like it, it was like a no-brainer really for me. So I just kind of yeah. just got into selling drugs full time. Really, and I got to the point where I, I, I didn't even bother signing on because I couldn't be asked getting out of bed to go and sign on for seventy quid. You know what I mean? That's kind of a, I, I got this 
<laughs> still living at my mum's house and dealing in wholesale drugs, but this big idea of like large yes, so I don't need to sign on, you know, look at me, I'm doing really well for myself. Um, and it just, it just mushroomed very, very quickly. Like I said, I've got a good business head and, um, I mean, these are things that kind of I talk about later on that become transferable skills and things that help me setting up NWRC. But I kind of I looked at where where I grew up and lads that I was selling drugs with, with stood on street corners with with mouthfuls of crack and heroin, spitting out ten pound deals for people, um, and and getting nicked or getting shot and and this that and the other. Whereas two miles the other way, you've got Manchester University student campus, which is just packed full of soppy middle-class kids who just want to get high for three years. So for me, I went the other way and I got into the student dealing scene and, and very quickly kind of absorbed a lot of smaller students. And this went on for about four or five years, but I actually got numbers passed on from year to year and I had like guys coming through. And in the end, I was just wholesale dealing via primarily students. Um, and this went on for about five years and life was great. It was fantastic. But I kind of recognised at that point that um, the further you go up the chain, the, the more violent it becomes and the more ruthless you have to become. And I just kind of knew that wasn't me. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I don't take a backward step from anyone. You can't when I grew up and I'm, I'm, I won't be physically intimidated by any man. I'll stand the corner of anyone. But I don't like violence or fighting unless it's the last resort, unless I'm, I'm protecting myself. So I just kind of knew that I, I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't make this long term because somebody bigger than me would come along and swallow me up and there'd be nothing I could do about it. And I was already getting a few pulls in that direction, a couple of guys who were higher up the food chain were trying to get me to work solely for them. And that had always been the beauty for me. I was independent, so I worked, I was getting supplied, wholesale supplied through my side, but also through Salford, uh, through Wivingshaw, um, I was supplying down, lads down in Wrexham. Um, so I kind of, and that was the, the unique selling point. I had like a, a boot in all camps. 